Jerry Haar is a public policy fellow with the Wilson Center's Latin American program. He's also a senior associate at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business and a business professor at Florida International University. Jerry, thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So he joins us today to talk about a very interesting piece, thought-provoking piece that you wrote where you say populists are the new elite. And here's part of what you wrote. Populism has achieved its greatest prominence yet with the candidacy of Donald Trump. And I guess now we can add to that the election of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. This movement could become a prominent and permanent fixture of the American political landscape. So my question is, what, what makes this more prominent than any populist movement of the past? Okay, thanks, John. Pleasure to be here. As I mentioned, let's go back to the past for a second. Sure. This is not a new phenomenon. Populism has been bubbling up for the last hundred years or so back to the time of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Bob LaFollette. We saw signs of this with George Wallace. Certainly the most recent significant sign was with Ross Perot, who garnered 19% of the vote in 1992 with a populist agenda that essentially catapulted Bill Clinton to the presidency over George H.W. Bush. Uh, it is very propitious for populism to come to fore at the present time due to all the changes in the world. Mainly we're talking about technology and globalization and how a certain segment, although a minority segment, nonetheless feels that they are falling behind or being left out altogether. And they uh, blame the elites for this, and that would be big business, Wall Street, the media for their problems. Donald Trump's rigged system, as he called it. Rigged system. And so they want somebody to be the champion of the quote unquote common man. Is Bernie Sanders part of this continuum as well? Oh, sure. Bernie Sanders comes at it from the uh, 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 left, and Donald Trump comes at it from the right. Some would say the alt right. So the conventional wisdom that we're going to refute here in a moment for, through your, your ideas is that, you know, this is the working poor versus the power brokers, whoever they might be at any given moment. But you have a different idea in mind. Right. Um, the, the problem here is we need to differentiate between the working class from the working poor. Mm -hmm. And my argument here in this piece is that uh, the working poor are completely different. The working class is not doing poorly. The median income of those who supported Mr. Trump was $72,000 a year, which puts them 15% above what non-Hispanic whites have as a median income. They feel they are falling behind or they're just staying, staying pat, for example, but they are by no means poor any stretch in the imagination. And what I argue in my piece as well is that essentially the working poor uh, that are holding down, say, the single mother of three that is working two or three jobs, for example, to get by, they're aligned more with quote unquote big business. When they can get imported goods and services that are far more affordable, clothing, for example, and shoes that are imported from Southeast Asia, for example, they're delighted with low or no tariffs. They don't want to bring jobs back to America if it means the basics that they need, of course, their basic needs are going to cost them a lot more. And that differentiates them from the, uh, the working class. Working class is almost self-assignment. It's not as much a technical term. Poor, we can measure income levels. Correct. Absolutely right. So this, so this uh, tr free trade or trade packs were demonized in this election uh, from both Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. particularly Mr. Trump, the, the eventual winner. Uh, what you're saying is that some of these trade prep packs would make the prices go up at places like Walmart or Target. Oh, absolutely. We hear about tariffs being raised by 45 percent, 35 to 45 percent on goods coming in uh, from Mexico, raising tariffs so on China because they're a currency manipulator, allegedly a currency manipulator, these kinds of things. This is going to hurt the working poor far more than the working class. Does it make sense to spend a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to save each job in a protected industry or should we let the market determine what the prices will be? So when you say this working class becomes, this, the populist within the working class become the new elite, why? Because they're out of touch with these realities that you describe for the working poor? 
because in their animosity towards the traditional elites, mm -hmm. and that would be the uh, uh, moneyed and intellectual interests the, uh, uh, on both coasts, for example, corridor from Boston, New York, and Washington, and then the greater LA area, these people that whom they believe uh, uh, are completely out of touch with them, for example, those particular groups, they are completely turning their back and neglecting on the working poor. The working poor are the prime beneficiaries of trade liberalization, finance liberalization, investment liberalization. Those are the ones who, in fact, are benefiting from free markets and do not wish to seal our borders and uh, under the uh, guise of unfair trade practices of our trading partners, raise tariffs or create non-tariff barriers. So how should we look at this? Is, is this what happened in this election and this campaign and this version of populism that's emerged? Is, is this a blip or is it a movement? Is this long term or was it short term? Well, it's uh, long term or in the past, as I mentioned, this has been bubbling beneath the surface for some time. Now, it is, the liquid has bubbled over from the pop. This is going to be with us for some time. And it's due to factors beyond these trade agreements. It has everything to do with technological change, globalization. When, and and it's the, the, the search for scapegoats is absolutely unbelievable. Let me give you a couple statistics here is that we're really concerned about our imports from Mexico under NAFTA, which uh, President-elect Trump calls the worst trade agreement in history. Now, there's no empirical evidence of that whatsoever. An independent trade analysis that has been done will show is that there have been marginal gains and marginal losses due to NAFTA. But let's take a look at that Ford coming in from Mexico, that Ford vehicle. It is booked as an export from Mexico, an import by the United States. But neglected from this entire situation is the fact that up to 67% of the components of that imported Ford vehicle are made in the United States, most often by unionized labor. Mm -hmm. So who is going to be harmed if we slap on a big tariff there? And by the way, these car companies are producing in emerging markets for customers in those emerging markets. And those emerging markets are importing more than ever from the United States. That's lost in this discussion, and we're searching for reasons for certain scapegoats in this. Do you have any confidence that either party uh, completely understands this? No, I don't. I don't, and I think is that uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. And what we are reaping is a neglect on the part of both political parties that have been toned up deaf to the concerns, the complaints of approximately a third or more than a third of the population that feels that we are falling behind. And both parties have done a horrendous job in trying to explain to the common man in language that they understand, very simply, what are the benefits of free markets. And uh, to the credit, to uh, President-elect Trump's credit, he has been able to hear their pain, feel their pain, and to be able to craft a message that responds and is communicated to them in terms they can understand. So this is a wake-up call, a message for both parties. But the overall trends of globalization, technological change, the need for uh, uh, working class individuals to enhance their skills to compete in a 21st century economy, that's not going to change. That is the same whatsoever. And I will say something else that is controversial, because I enjoy being controversial, <laughs> John, and that is a lot of the working class that is complaining that their communities are losing jobs and that they have very little opportunity uh, in their particular craft for advancement, either there or elsewhere. First of all, you elect your own representatives to Congress. Only 18 percent of the public believes Congress is doing a decent job. What are you doing with regard to having a conversation with your own representatives? What are your municipal and state economic development authorities doing to woo foreign manufacturers to come to the United States? Virginia, Georgia, uh, Texas, my own state of Florida, certainly North Carolina just shines at this, the Charlotte-Mecklenburg area, mm -hmm. what they've done in attracting car companies. Alabama is producing uh, Mercedes-Benz, for example. 
Honda's first plant in the United States, Marysville, Ohio. This is sound economic development promotion that is done not at the federal level. Don't ask Uncle Sam to solve your problems, but done at the state municipal level. And as far as Mr. and Mrs. Joe Sixpack are concerned, when they knock off the assembly line at 3.30 to go home, have a Budweiser and watch reruns of Laverne and Shirley, what are they doing to get to a community college, which is within 50 miles of where they live, to upgrade their job skills? Would you like to have cardiovascular surgery by a cardiologist that hasn't read a book since medical school 20 years ago? I don't think so. All of us need to compete. I'm a professor. I'm teaching now also online. What if I said, well, I'm not going to teach online. You know what? They should fire me then because online teaching is essential to education in the 21st century. This is the same thing with, um, with the American worker. There isn't a job in your town, but your skills are in high demand elsewhere. Say in Oregon, go to Oregon. We're a mobile society. <clears throat> Jerry, I'm, I see a, a run for office in your future. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, what I see is a need for less caffeine in my diet. <laughs> well, let me say, you use the word controversial. I'd, I'd use the word thought-provoking. And thank, thank you, you for a thought-provoking discussion. Thank you very much, Hope John. to speak to you again soon. Likewise.